Hello and welcome. This is a discussion I had with Nick Ochoski recently. It was an informal chat, but we covered a lot of ground. I felt it was worthy of uploading. I started recording a few minutes into the conversation with Nico stating what his long-term plans were moving forward. Rent a room and I'm going to run private clinics half of the time and then I can just run, uh, what do you call it, open clinics for whomever free of charge as well. But I want it to be my style so I need it to be private. And I want to have an engine of a car, like kind of like stuck on the wall that guys can like play with. Yeah. And you can just start that, that and things to do, for example, and practical things, maybe a pool table, something big. And that's going to be the consultation room. And you start, you, you know how guys only open up after like, I don't know, just like chilling with guys and talking yeah. to them and they eventually open up. That's that's what guys do. I, I mean, I can imagine if you were running sessions, mm. it would be like how many sessions until someone opens up and says something. Oh, yeah. of any value exactly so it's designed to specifically break away uh, you know through their defenses and sure. you know you can be doing the the engine of the car or you know playing games or just some pool or whatever right mm. and maybe after so many sessions they'll start talking and then you get down to the to the actual point the thing that's troubling them because do you know what the equivalent is right now in the NHS what <laughs> 10 minutes consultation <laughs> <laughs> and both you and I know that that is a ridiculous ridiculous thing yeah. especially when is that you know guys or, or right across it's for both genders for both genders but women yeah. walk in they just you know they take half an hour and they just don't stop talking right mm -hmm. guys come in sit down they might talk for one minute out of the 10 minutes and they will say nothing of any value yeah. right they'll be like well can i have some sleeping pills and it'll be like okay so tell me what's happening in your life you get nothing you get yeah. nowhere yeah. and you need to do it for so many sessions until you get something out of it it doesn't happen very often i would book those guys at the end of clinics when i was doing my gp rotation so that i could stretch it so if i finished five i could finish at like 5 30 5 40. yeah uh, otherwise it wouldn't work so, you know, uh, MGTOW has helped some men. I mean, through me at least, personally, I have helped some men. <laughs> sure. What's the kind of feedback that you've gotten from, uh, from men that um, have stated that you've helped them? What have, what have they, I guess, actively applied in their life? What have they done differently? Or is it I don't know, change? man. I've, I've had guys who, uh, who told me that they've changed I mean, the majority of people told me that I've saved them from, you know, suicide and shit like that. I'm pretty sure you get that as well. Sure. Uh, but not many of them actually, and that that was the point with the Dark Knight video, right? Because yeah. he had the same thing. Like people tell him, you know, I'm not gonna kill myself anymore and stuff like that, but but they just get stuck. <laughs> yeah. And and that's the that's the annoying thing with the moving forward. Let, let's see. I mean, what is it? Uh, fucking hell! There is a guy. Um, where the fuck? And, okay, hi Nico. A few months back, I had commented on one of your videos about suicide, showing my little desperation and bored your thoughts and fantasies of actually going through with it. You answered the fellow man. Answered. I just wanted to. Uh, to let, tell you that your action turned things around for me. An extended hand familiar in the hell reality wakes those men that survived the awakening. So it's, it's messages like this, but mm. I think afterwards, then you need to sit and talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. And I've talked to guys one-on-one -on -one, and even like speaking to them and just like being optimistic about everything. Mm. I think they just go away and they're feeling better, which is weird. And a lot of them try things. I think the problem is when they try something and they fail and then they just go back to misery. And I'm like, man, I fail all the fucking time. That's the whole point. Sure. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, man. I, that, that is actually a problem because I think preventing suicide, showing them the truth and stuff like that, that's easy. Now, moving them forward, that is difficult. Sure. Um, I, I guess in terms of, 
as a doc, I mean, how long have you been practicing medicine? Uh, Aman, I'm, I'm, I'm young. I've been doing it for like, this is my third year as a sure. doctor qualified. Right, right. Okay. Um, I mean, in terms of, I, I guess, in the medical field, I, I've had a lot of interactions with medical professionals over the years as well, a lot of arguments with them too. Um, but I, I know that they're always striving to, you know, to present that option. Um, you know, this, this is a problem, this is how we solve it, this is how we move forward, that sort of thing. Um, I guess the question is, how much do you feel a personal responsibility for moving someone forward? Yeah, I fucking hate it. Yeah. Um, that, that is the thing, because it's not um, something that I can prescribe something. It's not an infection that I have a given cure for it. It's not my cure. I mean, the things that I've, I've gone through, the things that you've gone through in your life, they have shaped a certain person, right? A certain mm -hmm. individual that's, um, that's different, special in some way, right? Unique. And I go through difficulties in my life and I just deal with them in, in the way that I deal with them. Sure. And I, I know that the direction should always be forward and I just do that. Yeah. I don't know how to pass that to someone else. Sure. It is difficult to, to give them a prescription of, of something. There is, I can't give them solutions and I refuse to give them solutions. When I speak to them privately, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll sit with them and... <clears throat> I'll, I'll argue things like, uh, so what do you want to do? And I'll be like, uh, I don't know, man, you know, there are so many dangers with women. I don't know if I want to, you know, date anyone. I don't know if I want to take this job. I don't know if I want to go and do that. And I'm like, what do you want to do? <laughs> I mean, it's not a difficult question. I'm like, just don't imagine the failure ahead. Just imagine the path if that succeeds. And sure. if it fails, then try it in a different way. Just find your destination. And I mean, not the distant destination, just the most, the closest destination that you can imagine. Sure. And then just take it one step at a time. And I don't know how to, how to do that without, by being prescriptive. Because people told me off for not being prescriptive. Like, oh. Nico, you're a doctor. You know, doctors prescribe shit all the time. Why don't you prescribe? <laughs> And I'll be like, how can I tell a person, right? Yeah, yeah. Go and do that, right? Mm. I, it, it won't work. It, of course, it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's, I, I get a lot of messages from men, um, and they basically lay it out. You know, I don't have any energy, but I want to do this. Um, i moving in this direction, but uh, I don't have the energy to do this. So I don't know. Yeah. I say that, mate, you've already got the, got the answers. You know, we all have the answers. Men already have that. I'm not telling men anything they don't already know. But it's the one thing that you discover when you actually work with men in group settings is that men, as a group particularly, I mean, they need to be 100% committed to taking personal responsibility for their issues. You now, actually mm -hmm. finding solutions rather than externalizing blame. Because, um, I mean, that, that's where men actually, where he actually makes real progress. You know, it's, it's moving past that safe zone. Because when you're in a group like that, um, and it's it happens online, and well, o online is great in a lot of regards, but it also has its pitfalls, you know. Because um, mm -hmm. those group group members, uh, they can form a codependency. It's where they feel literally impotent, and, and they're just raging. They're full of anger. They're but, wallowing in their yeah, misery, and, man. And they're still looking towards you know society. They're still looking towards the system for a solution. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. But that's a solution that, in truth, uh, I mean, can only come from inside them. And, and there is an excuse. In everything that you say, there is a ready-made excuse. Like, for example, you'll tell them um, something like, go and do something with your life. Anything, right? I, I never, I'm never prescriptive. <laughs> I'm like, find sure. the thing that you like and go and do it. And they'll be like, but then I'll be helping the system. I'm like, so what? Are you going to just lie down and die? What, what do you mean? Of course, whatever you're going to do can help the system. There are things that you can do that's not going to help the system. I don't care what you're going to do. Mm. Even if your ultimate dream is to sit at home and play the, I don't know, next Fallout, which is coming out. I don't care. Just find something that's going to make you really happy and do it. And I think if this thing, and I find... This thing about men, I mean, me 
I, I mean, I'm active. I, sp I spend 12 hours a day, maybe more every day outside, right? Outside at minimum. So I'll be doing something. I'll be engaging with people. I am active at whatever I'm doing. I know I spend some time online, but I try to minimize that because I've noticed that spending time online and perhaps in the environment that I'm spending time online in, um, it's actually draining energy from you. Not draining energy, sure. but making you sure. almost... Stardust puts it as conser uh, conservation of energy. You know, a person wants to remain in a state of, you yeah. know, the same. And it's true to, to a point, but it's not laziness. Um, it's not lack of motivation because people will tell you, you, you know, I want to do, I want to do this. I don't have the energy to do that though. I mean, I don't have the energy as an excuse. Go out and do. I mean, there's nothing more I can tell you in order to increase this want of doing something. If the want is big enough, you'll jump to the opportunity to do something. I think, I think Stardust is right that the lack of women, in a way, mm. is taking away a lot of the motivation from guys. And, and it's true to an extent. I mean, with me, it hasn't really taken that much away from me. It really hasn't. Well, it's, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, uh, I've seen this in groups, you know, um, yeah, members of that group, they, they become dependent, entirely mm -hmm. dependent on the dialogue moving in a, in a certain way. Um, and, and that group, there can't be any expression of any other needs without, you know, uh, explicit censorship or, or just immediate invalidation of those needs. Yeah, you know, I've seen that online. I mean, you've seen it too in the comments section. A man says, well, you've said it. Um, <laughs> That a man wants to experience intimacy, uh, you know, with a female again, mm -hmm. but what he's just expressed just gets invalidated immediately by the men, and it shuts down discussion. That man, what happens? He just clams up. He doesn't feel safe anymore. He doesn't feel safe to share again. So what does he do? He just keeps stum. He just keeps quiet. Mm -hmm. And all that leads to is just that man becoming increasingly isolated. I mean, what you've got, you've got conversation at a really censored level. Um, and then it becomes a case of enabling. Everybody's enabling each other. But and it, and it, it's yeah. no, sorry. And it's condescension almost to the basic needs almost of of people. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it it comes down to choice. Everything's about choice. If if my channel stands for anything, it, it's telling men that they can make a choice. They have that power, and you can choose. You can choose to be a victim, or you can choose to be a survivor. So what, what's the difference between a victim and a survivor? A victim cuts himself off from growth. You know, they cut themselves off from, from support. They see everyone as threats instead of you know, a foundation to build a house on. You know, they don't see networks as an opportunity for growth. Um, a survivor, they start moving forward proactively. What are they doing? He's utilizing everything around him. He's utilizing his environment, his support networks. He, he's taking his power back. So it's, you know, it's... Yeah, that's how I see it. But it's 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 putting the onus back on the man. The man has to take a hundred percent responsibility for his actions and for his choices, and he has that choice. He has to realize that. I mean, I mean, I, I the the thing is, it seems like when when I when you say this, I mean, I love it, right? Mm. The fact that you're throwing me a hundred percent responsibility means that a hundred percent of my life is my doing, right? Exactly. That, that's how I see it. I exactly. see it as something positive rather than something negative. But then there are guys who will see this as kind of like you victim blaming them almost in a way. Oh, I've been a victim of uh, the situations and all that. And, and, you know, to an extent, they didn't know these truths. That's absolutely true, right? You, you were a victim. Now, you know, stop acting like a victim. Yeah. You know, you know, I mean, it's not just, okay, snap out of it, get over it. I mean, all of us need to take the victim kind of like identity for a second. It's kind of like the sick role that we have in medicine. So you need to be sick first and you need, yep. people need to acknowledge that you're sick so that then you can get better. But then you need to stop acting like you're sick after a certain point because, Absolutely. you know, you've had all the treatment 
you're supposed to be better. And then you have people with chronic fatigue syndromes. Um, you have people with Munchausen syndromes that, you know, try to claim back that sick role because people were giving them attention. It's a lot, it's a lot safer, you know, uh, yeah. to not have the responsibility, you know, for what's happening to you. To, <laughs> and it's sad. Yeah. It becomes like a protective buffer. I mean, mm. you're telling people that you can't possibly understand my experience unless you've walked in my shoes. Um, so, you know, and they're basically holding up the trauma as, as a sign. It's a badge, you know, say, look at what I've suffered. And what they're looking for from people is, is an acceptance of that. They're, they're waiting for an apology that will never come. Yeah, you know, mm. all that does is just push people away. But in reality, what is it? It's a cry for help. And where does that stem from? It stems from the same fucking place that everything else stems from, from a need for connection. Yeah, you know, I've, I've said it before. I mean, holding on to resentment is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have, you have a choice. I mean, you can shift your mindset. You can let go of all negative bullshit. You can let go of the hatred, all these repetitive thoughts that just eat away at you. I mean, you, you essentially, you stop living like a victim. You know, mm -hmm. you, you stop blaming the world for, for all the issues and the problems that you've faced. Um. And, uh, uh, you know, acknowledging that, that, you know, your decisions as a man, you know, played a part in this, in this outcome, that's awareness. And what it is, essentially, when you get right down to it, is a form of forgiveness. Yeah, and a man in that space, just like you, just like me, you know, we can help men better understand their experience. We become a torchbearer. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I personally tell people I do not forgive, I do not forget. Right. Mm -hmm. But I do not, I, I see, I think people see forgiveness as a very valuable tool in uh, kind of like, sure. um, you know, getting by things. And I guess for some people it is, I mean, I just let it go. Right. I don't hold a grudge anymore. I don't mm -hmm. feel anything, but I don't forget. I mean, I don't forget no, what happened to me. Yeah, yeah. No, should you? Yeah, definitely. Cause I mean, forgiveness, it's, I guess, because it's not, it's not explained very well. People think it's, well, absolving someone, mm. but it, it's got nothing to do with absolving someone of, of a crime or, or what they've perpetrated against you, not at all. It has everything to do with just relieving yourself of the burden of being a victim. I mean, what are you doing? You're, you're letting go. You're letting go of the pain and you're, you're, you're making a transformation. You're, you're, you're going from victim to survivor. It has nothing to do with absolving anyone of what they've done. You're holding that person accountable, but you're letting go of all their pain. Yeah. It's, I, I think that that is, a, that is a very nice way of, of looking at things. I mean, I remember, who was it? It was Bill Burr, and this is completely relevant, right? <laughs> it was Bill <laughs> I, I like Bill Burr. I like his, I like his work. He's hilarious. He, yeah, he's man. He's the funniest guy I've ever watched, and he's yeah. so he's so accurate with women. But anyway, irrelevant. He was talking about religion, right? And he was saying, you know, what do you mean you let go of God and stuff like that? And he did this, um, he did this. Uh, I don't know act where he was uh, saying this. Uh, what was it? This prayer, and you know, the prayer was just like washing away, and then you couldn't hear it anymore, and they just went. Kind of like that. That's how. Right. That's how I see things. You know, things that may have damaged me and stuff like that, or you know, th bad things that may have happened to me, or people close to me. You know, things that you hold resentment for. Th mm. Things that are kind of like shouting in your ears. You know, when it's going through, uh, b when it just happened, like, or for the next mm. couple of months, or maybe years afterwards. It's kind of like someone shouting in your head, you know, this and this happened to you, this and this and this and this happened to you. And it wears you down. And then I just imagine it just ah, fading away into the distance. And then you just don't hear it. And the process takes, you know, it takes some time to happen, but it just happens. And then yeah. you just find yourself and you're like, holy shit, there is nothing, <laughs> nothing that's holding me back. So, you know, it's a brand new day. Let's go out and let's have fun. That's what I do. Yeah. And, it's a very simplistic way, though. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I like things simple. I always do. You know, I, I'm an avid, avid collector of quotes you know, because I think there's so much more that can be said in just a few words than just, you know, 
rattling on on a big diatribe, you know. That's why I never get much out of my interactions with females. Um, it's, it's just they talk a lot, but there's, there's just no substance. <laughs> yeah, whereas you can talk to a guy who, who doesn't say much. I've talked to some of the hardest men you could ever meet, and mm. they'll just say something, just off the cuff. You say, you know what? God, that makes sense. You know, it's just like that makes so much sense. It makes you see things in such a simplified format. You know, it's, yeah, okay. Yeah, but, I, mean, I, yeah. I mean, it's beautiful, isn't it? They just take the essence of like hours of whatever you said and they just say it in like under 10 words. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And it makes sense. You go, fuck, what did I think of that? And that, <laughs> that goes for everything. Um, you know, we, we're all, we say we'd taken the red pill, but there's so many things in life when it comes to anything from business to investments to, to anything down the line where you think, why the fuck didn't I think of it that way? Mm. You know, I, I, why didn't I see it that way until you meet someone? I mean, the simplest guys that I've ever met are some of the richest men that I've ever met. Guys like property investors, um, you know, different businessmen, and they came from shit. But they just had this very simplified way of looking at things, and it's completely contradictory to how we view things. You know, we think we have to work hard to the day that we die and scrimp and save and be slaves to the system. These guys weren't. You know, they looked at that and they said, that doesn't work. Okay, I'm going to go in this direction. I think, ah, okay. And all it is is about mindset. Everything. I used to get really frustrated when I see someone like Steve Jobs um, get up on stage and give a you know, really inspirational speech. But I felt like screaming at the guy, you're, you're saying nothing. You're giving me, you're not giving me the information. Give me the fucking information. But um, it's all mindset because the information is there. It's very simple. All you need to do is make a decision, accept the risk, and follow through on that choice. <laughs> but, okay, right. That's how it works. That, that, man, it, it was the same thing with my with the job that I'm doing now. I mean, I worked, right? I worked. Mm. I'm like, okay, fuck. I'm not going to do this all my life. I was doing it. Um, I tried. I, I was looking at the, how long it would take to get enough money so that I can survive on my own. I saw another plan, a way out. And I, and I got it, I, I mean, within like under a month, I applied for another job. And then I told, I told them, look, I'm like, I'm, I'm thinking of leaving. And mm -hmm. I made the decision and now I'm leaving. I'm leaving the job and I have a new job coming up very soon. And, and, I'm, and the guys are, the, there is a guy, mm -hmm. he's single like I am. He's five years, six years, six years actually ahead of me in the job. Can you imagine? And he told me that he hated the job since day one. Right? <laughs> yeah. and, and he's like, man, you're so brave uh, from do, uh, for doing this. I'm like, dude, are, are you married? Why, why are you doing this to yourself? Yeah. yeah. Why, why would you put yourself through this torture? And he's like, I don't know, man. I just never thought about leaving. <laughs> yeah. And I, I left. And this guy is planning to leave six years afterwards he has gray hair man yeah, right <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It, it's he's spent hours years slaving away right because mm -hmm. it's a very hard job it's yeah. enjoyable at times but it's a very hard job and um <laughs> he, he just never crossed his mind he just said well you know life sucks right <laughs> there's no, nothing i can do to change that <laughs> Yeah. Um, I can't potentially do anything else. And now that he saw me do it, like, and, and I'm young, like I'm, I'm relatively outspoken. I have fun. I just don't care a lot. I speak back to my consultants, you know, I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm just going to do it like this. If you don't like it, you can overrule me, but you need to write in the notes. I don't give a shit. Right. I'm, I'm like that. I'm, I'm very yeah. outspoken, even, even at work. And, uh, he, he saw it and he's like, man, I'm quitting. I'm quitting in like two months. I'm leaving the job and stuff like that. And it, all, all that person needed was to see someone else take that step as if that step has never been taken by anyone else. Yeah. And I find that astonishing that people will just stay and suffer and complain every day about what they're doing, but not take a step forward to change that, change the reality. There was actually, um, let me see if I got it. Um, let's have a look at my, my library. Uh, fuck was it? So 
Sorry, I got everything bookmarked. There's <laughs> one by William Reich, I think it was. Um, look, I, f I fucking love this quote. It's got it here, I'll read it. Um, hang on. Here it is, here it is. The great man was once a very little man, but he recognized the smallness and the narrowness of his thoughts and his actions. And he learned how to see how his smallness and how his pettiness endangered his happiness. A great man knows when and in what way he is a little man. A little man does not know he is little and is afraid to know. He hides his pettiness and his narrowness behind illusions of strength and greatness, someone else's strength and greatness. And he's proud of his great generals, but not of himself. And he admires an idea of other men, not his own. And the less he understands something, the more firmly he believes in it. And the better he understands an idea, the less he believes in it. That was William <laughs> Reich's, um, I think it was Listen, Little Man. Mm -hmm. It's a fucking great book. Yeah. But yeah, things like that, I mean, book. yeah, yeah. But you're absolutely <laughs> right, you know, it's, people just, they stay where it's familiar. They don't want to move out of that zone, you know. But, um. Is it the danger of the unknown? I mean, what do you think? Um, I mean, it comes down to just, I believe it's, it's just this little voice inside their head. Everybody's got that voice. Um, and if your reality doesn't match that little voice, that little internal script that's running in your head, um, your subconscious will find a way to make it, make it match. Unless you're actually, you know, processing things, unless you're getting introspective. It's like with my videos. Um, people criticize them and say, oh, they're very emotive. You know, he's just, he's going for an emotional reaction. No, it's, this is, these videos are just an expression of my own meditative process. You know, I, I go and go to visualizations. I listen to music. I see images in my head. It's not like I go up to someone on, on the street and say, do you know that men exist in a state of perpetual isolation? I mean, it's not going to go down very well, is it? <laughs> <laughs> the majority of the time, I'm, I'm just very light with people. I, I like to engage with people, but... Um, you know, that, that's me in my more reflective, introspective moments, but we need that as human beings. How many people actually go down that path? We do everything we can to deflect ourselves from that. So a guy that's staying in, like your mate, staying in that job for all those years, has he ever asked himself the question, so is this what I want to do? Is this me? You know, how, mm. you know, how, does, how do my personality, my needs, my wants match with this job and this path that I'm taking? If he asked himself honestly, he did some introspection, it, the answer would be no, and he'd move on. And it's actually, for me, it, it was Mikta that gave me that thinking. Yeah. Um, I, I, I thought about my life, and I'm like, okay, look, I'm, I'm single. I'm probably going to be single forever, right? Uh, probably, definitely, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, my needs are going to be you know this much i'll need this much money so i don't need a lot i'll be able to survive no matter what i do i'll be able to survive so what do i need in my life this and this but a very important part was that since i'm going to spend at least eight hours a day at a job right at least for the foreseeable future i want that job to be something that's going to be balanced with my life so that i can at least have some time to exercise or at least you know not have excuses for not exercising let's use it like that mm. um and uh i need a certain balance i have one time to read i want time to do independent uh, studying if i want to do it maybe i want to do some evolutionary psychology eventually or some psychology of some kind this you know outside medicine you know just for me right i don't i don't care whether it's applicable to work or it's going to help me in any way i just want to do things for me and uh, when i realized that with the job that i had that was impossible no matter how much pleasure sure. it could potentially give me you know some days are fucking brilliant you know i'll be working and it will feel like an amazing high but after the high then you know you get to the low and i wanted the job for me to be just in a narrow spectrum of bads and highs right not very high not very low i want it to be able to be planned to be able to you know, rearrange my life in such a way that I can 
do things that I want. And if I can, if I need to take some time off work in order to do something or pursue something else, I needed to rearrange my life in that pattern. Therefore, the decision was fucking simple. My, it was so simple. I just wanted to do something else. What else am I interested in? Found psychiatry. I'm like, okay, yeah, fuck it. That's what I'm doing. Right. And it was a job that I loved before when I did my psych rotation uh, as a medical student, when I worked in psychiatry as a qualified doctor. And I was like, OK, yeah, it was it was enjoyable. My life was brilliant when I was doing that. Why don't I just do that? And it seemed to be that, you know, I could help people as well <laughs> for yes, some yeah. strange reason. So, um yeah, why not do that? And they, the choice was so simple. I mean, even if it fails, right? Imagine I, I'll start, I can start uh, the job and I might not enjoy it. I'm not planning for not enjoying it, by the way. I'm planning to fully enjoy it. But if I don't enjoy it, so what? I've tried. Then I can try something else. I can do something else. There's so many things that I can do. I mean, the unknown for me, mm. it doesn't scare me. I see years ahead, even if I don't have many years, you know, I see decisions lying, you know, the next day, the following day, etc. cetera, of what, of what I want to do. And I just do it. I, I don't know how else to describe it. It's like, this is what I need to do. And in order to do that, I need to do this and this and this. Okay, let's do that. Yeah. That's what I, <laughs> it's not difficult. No. Um, the first step is the most difficult one, like the decision, yeah, yeah. you know, should I? Should I do that? But once you do the small thing, like for, for us, it would be applying, right? Applying for a new job. But once you open that website where we do the applications, for example, then everything just comes out. On the same day, the application was sent, everything was done. And I was like, holy shit, I just did that. <laughs> yeah. That's and right. Yeah. It works out in the end. Most of the times, I think it works out. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you look at life. I mean, the only constant, the only constant in life is change. You know, it's 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 always going to be that way. And I mean, it's why people can't move on is because they're scared to face face their weakness, scared to face their vulnerability. I mean, you look at someone like um, someone who's we've all suffered trauma to an extent, but I mean, it's about processing that trauma, about facing that weakness. I mean, that's where real strength comes from. I mean, you've heard about the five stages of um, of grief. Mm. Yeah, Dabda. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there was a there was a guy. Was it Joseph? Was it Joseph or George? Could be George Banana. I think I'm thinking about the mafia gangster. But um, <laughs> yeah, one of them. But he came up with the idea. I think it was coping ugly, um, where he came to the conclusion that um, people that go through grief, a large number of people, they don't go through those stages. They actually come to a point where they're resilient. So that's what strength is. It's resilience. It's the capacity to be adaptive. You know, it's, it's a shift in mindset. You know, with, with that trauma, that those experiences, they essentially become a catalyst for, for the stimulus for change. Oh. So what are you doing? You're, you're creating a different reality for yourself. And it starts internally. I mean, you're training your brain and your physiology to react in a way that fosters positive thoughts and actions. So... You know, it's coming to the understanding that you have choice, but it starts internally and all it takes from there on is follow through. But first you've got to look inside and how many people are willing to do that? I mean, we're so distracted in the society um, that it's, it's become about distractions. It hasn't become about finding happiness. So all this validation that we seek externally, all these, you know, distractions that, that, that we that we follow through on, that, that we pursue. I mean, all it causes is just misery and chaos inside ourselves mostly. You know, it's, it's a very empty experience for most people. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, it's sad, though. Isn't as it sad? I mean, mm. I'm, I, 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 who was I talking to? I don't even remember. Uh, I was talking to one young guy recently, and uh, he was telling me about happiness and, you know, going about finding happiness and, you know, how do you go about doing that? And I'm like, dude, you know, I don't even look for happiness, man. I don't, I don't, I, I'm like, I just want to be in a constant state of discontent. And, and he's like, what, what the, <laughs> it's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, if I don't feel, you know, like everything is awesome all the time, I'm not going to stay still. I'm going to keep doing things. And, you know, that's how I, I find happiness. If I keep doing new shit, 
you know, even my, my channel is kind of like my brain. If, if you go on my channel, it's like all sorts of shit in there. It doesn't even make sense. Some of the videos highly emotional, right? Yeah. Where I, you know, I'm, I can imagine myself, you know, with a cigarette, drinking beer and just contemplating the cosmos, right? That's kind of how I, I that's yeah. one side of me. The other one is me making like kind of like chipmunk voices for women where it's my fun, fun. side of, yeah, where, where, where I speak like, meh, you know how women do you dress? Speak? Do you dress up in the furry outfit? It's a fetish, isn't it? Of course, sexual man. fetish. Come, come on, of course. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't tried that, it's brilliant. I'm Anyways, sure. <laughs> take a whiff. For it. I speak about my dick in hangouts and kind of like break the tension every. It, that, that's what I mean. Like uh, I like, uh, I like to do many things. That's why for me, happiness in a way is a constant state of discontent. And okay. if I if you see me in a room and I'm on my own, you'll be seeing me rocking, kind of like, you know, like I have severe autism and I don't know what to do. I need to do something. I need to stay active. That, I'm, yeah. that, that's who I am. I'm kind of like a kid with ADHD, like a boy running around. Right. And my brain is, is never happy if it's not doing something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I know that will kill a lot of people if they are to, <laughs> to take that advice on. So don't just do that. Try to do what works for you, you know? Well, it's interesting. It's, it's something that um, I've been taking more notice of recently. I, I, you know, I stepped out of the field that I was involved with before and I, I still network with a lot of people, um, but not as much as I used to. Um, and as a result of that, um, my, my sort of, my contact with people is, has dwindled. Um, and it's quite interesting that, um, you know, I, I have less contact with the people now. Um, and it's made me more aware of, of just how many people are sort of in this, this bubble, especially men, in terms of loneliness that they experience. Um, mm. I, I, you know, we all know what happened to Robin Williams. This is a very successful man who ended up getting milked by, you know, three different females or four different females at the end of it, had his Holy kids shit. torn away from him. But I remember a quote he said that, um, he said he thought the worst thing in life was to die alone. And he said, actually, the worst thing in life is to be around people that make you feel completely alone. Mm. And it's, I look back on, you know, those years I, I spent with those people and that's kind of how I felt. Like I'm in a happier place now, um, and I have less contact with these people, but, it's, it's made me think about loneliness and, 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 and what that means, what it actually is. Uh, it's, um, it, it's not just an external loneliness. It's not just getting that, that feedback or the validation from people. It's about having that connection with self. Yeah, and, and when you actually get right down to it, and I've, I've seen a lot of men online, I know you've gotten a lot of criticism uh, for talking about, you know, <laughs> as you do. Um, <laughs> about, you know, seeking or pursuing um, interactions with females. But we look at it, I mean, from birth, we, we have an inbuilt need, you know, to actually form emotional attachments with people. And what is that? It's a survival instinct. You know, it's, it's a need to bond. It's a, it's a need to be socially inclusive, mm -hmm. you know, to, to experience affection, to experience intimacy, and that is a survival instinct. <laughs> Yeah, and if if you really think about it, I mean, this motivation, this 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 motivation to be socially inclusive, to be around other people, I mean, this has led to the greatest discoveries we've ever had in society. Yeah, it's it's led to the growth of language, so mm -hmm. we can communicate with one another. It's 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 led to to great scientific discoveries, and all that comes from just having this 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 need for an emotional base of security. All of it stems from that. And to deny that is, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's incredibly damaging because this, when we feel this pain, this pain of loneliness, that, that we have a need to, to, to connect with women, that we have a need to connect with society, that, you know, for a lot of men, this is a very real experience, that they're, mm -hmm. they're celibate, but um, not by choice. They're, they're isolated from people, but not by choice. You know, that they've, they've been relegated to, to almost a class of second class citizen. And that pain that they're feeling, I, I honestly believe, I believe that's a survival instinct. Just as much as, you know, the, the need, you know, the, 
thirst that we feel, the hunger that we feel, it's the body and the mind telling us that we're, we're in a, a state of survival, that we need help, that we need assistance. Mm -hmm. So to yeah. deny that and run that down, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very damaging. I mean, I mean, I think, I think what we've done in MGTA, I mean, we've analyzed women to death, right? Mm -hmm. We've analyzed women to death. We've made them, <laughs> we've described them as evil on occasion. Um, they, we've, on, as cockroaches uh, on another occasion. I mean, I, <laughs> I've watched multiple videos and I found them qu quite funny. I mean, I was this, I remember when I, when I was talking with Dark Knight and he was saying that, you know, we hate female nature. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Do we actually hate female nature? I'm completely indifferent to it, right? It doesn't matter. I can't change what is. What, okay, so maybe I'm not gonna have the best conversations with the majority of women. Maybe I'm not going to find that, you know, deep emotional connection with them where my entire being is in this eternal maternal hug in a way. I, yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how people, you know, imagine uh, me being maybe, I don't know, uh, the, the avatar that I'm using right now, hairy baby, you know, being cuddled by this woman with big bosoms. That's not what I imagine my, my life as mm. being, as, but I think that, I mean, I'm a, I'm a very social person. Mm. I like talking to people. I, I enjoy challenging people's opinions. I enjoy, you know, thriving a bit in the chaos of the situation. And um, it's nice. I mean, finding women and talking to them, I enjoy it. I, f I enjoy a lot more having deep conversations with men as we, as the majority of us mm. do for that matter. But if I, if I find a, a woman and I talk to her and I enjoy her conversation, I'm not, I'm not going to think instantly, oh, you know, she's female. She might potentially tell me, you know, um, that I, uh, you know, I raped her or something like that. I don't know. I mean, all of these things are in the minds of many MGTOW men, right? Any engagement with any female is potentially damaging. And it, I mean, there is always a potential there, but I can speak to a guy that I've never met and he can beat the living shit out of me. And if history is something to go by, I mean, the majority of crime happens from men to other men. Women generally don't have the power to do that. So even, even thinking about it conceptually or, you know, logically, it doesn't compute. So I, I try to, yes, it's good to know about female nature, but it's also good to know about male nature. And by extent, if you're learning about male nature, fucking learn about yourself and don't seclude yourself from completely every experience that may come from anywhere, either in society, either, you know, from dangerous simp men and all of these things or women in general, because then the only person that's left is you. And I know it might be interesting listening to your voice every now and then. I mean, I do it on occasion. I do listen to my videos every now and then. But, you know, it's just me talking to myself. It's not really a conversation. I'm not gaining anything new. Yeah. And that, that is the point. You gain something from a conversation. Mm. Even, even the most... You said something about the miracle of language in a way, you know, mm. the, the fact that we communicate with each other. I, I don't speak English as my first language and I'm handicapped in a way in communicating perfectly with you. But can you imagine people like Newton, right? Um, yeah. Who was it? Uh, other people who were slightly autistic. They were slightly autistic. Mm. Uh, they couldn't communicate well with other people. They were very eccentric, etc. But they could communicate their ideas, m fucking massive ideas in written language, in in equations, in whatever, in the theories that they created. And those theories would be absolutely meaningless mm. if they just existed in that person's head. So even people like Newton or other, you know, excellent mathematicians or physicists who were slightly autistic and very secluded and were doing things their own, in their own, on their own and in their own ways, etc. They had the need to communicate the answer to, to the rest of the world they knew that their answers meant absolutely nothing if they, if they weren't accepted by by everyone else or yeah. you know if they weren't tested by even the scientific community mm -hmm. so if we understand this then why don't we you know try to simply live our lives 
understand the risks, appreciate the risks, you know, do the, your engagement with women if you really feel the need to do that. And, you know, I don't even feel bad. Uh, I mean, I speak to guys and, and I think even you at some point, you weren't engaging at all with females. Stardust, for example, doesn't do it at all. Um, and, you know, if, if you're happy, if this is your life and this is how you want to live your life and you're generally happy, do it. But if this is not how you see your life in being if you're not comfortable yeah. you know sitting still in the way that you're sitting then why don't you change it and it goes back to to the other situation it's difficult to see your shortcomings and then or or not even your shortcomings your life as it is and uh, not liking it and, and doing something about it seeing a solution and just doing it and i'm not saying getting married i'm not saying do something idiotic or just hump every woman that you see in your path i mean i i did that before but try to be a bit more <laughs> try to be a bit more rational about things it's not sure it's not the worst thing that can happen to you yeah. i think I mean, but I'm I'm romantic. I'm optimistic. I'm a PUA and a pussy beggar. I mean, all of these things are. Yeah. What What the fuck are you doing on my channel? Get off. Fucking PUA. <laughs> I'm I'm running away, man. I'm running away. <laughs> no, but you're right. We, what it comes down to is we need to change the language, you know, and we we can't fear losing the argument. I mean, and like you and me, every other man, once we've spoken, we we don't have to justify ourselves, and we shouldn't fear losing control because fear limits you. I mean, it's admitting weakness is strength. It's a springboard. So you've got to utilize that. And I mean, a lot of guys, you know, their channels are completely devoted to women. You know, these MGTOW channels, just criticizing female nature. You go on the forums, you go on Facebook groups, same thing. And there's a lot of men that are in the sphere at the moment, um, the sphere, um, that are really angry. I mean, they're grieving, but they're craving intimacy. Mm -hmm. And that's why so much focus is placed on women. And some of it, yes, absolutely, is to warn other men. But a lot of it is this craving. It's this longing. And we need to lay our cards on the table, actually state that openly. Because, um, I mean, I'm looking at a lot of guys today, and I can understand the stigma around it as well. Um, if you know, What's worse than being lonely? What's, what's worse than being a man on his own? You know, you're going to be judged. You're going to be feared. You know, there, there's a lot of accusations that can put your way um, mm -hmm. if you're a man on his own. And a lot of that is, is out of his control. And it's got nothing to do with the way that he looks. He could be a good-looking guy. But for whatever reason, you know, he, he can't interact with females because, like they say, the dating game is rigged. Um, you know, I'm a good-looking guy. You know, I keep my body in shape. I've got a lot of options. But once I'm outside of that social group, do women pay me the slightest bit of attention? Not really. Yeah, I can get my foot on the door, but can I close the deal? No, not really. And unless MGTOW is like a hangout for GQ models, um, a lot of these guys on these videos say, sex is easy, I get it by the bucket load. It's nothing, I just, you know, it's always come easy to me. Well, the only real way that I've gotten sex in the past is through my social group through social, social proofing, social validation from other females. You know, I, I, they'll talk to my friends and the girl will come up to me. She barely wants to know my name. She just made that decision. Okay, I've talked to your friends. You've been validated. Now I'll be with you. Um, in everyday life, it's completely opposite. I've got a friend, and I, I think I told you, told you about him. Um, but, I mean, he's probably the best-looking guy that I've ever seen. I mean, he makes Ryan Gosling look like an ugly fuck. I mean, he walks down, <laughs> he walks down the street. I've, I've never seen anything like a woman will run up to him and take photos with him, take selfies with him. Yeah, he gets that kind of adulation, that attention. Men will stop in the street and want to shake his hand. The second he opens his mouth, it's like someone spat in their face. Hmm. Yeah, because he's got a handicap, he's deaf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, they can't process it. It's like it's a slap in their face. It's, it's fucked with the their, their perfect picture of who he is as a man. You know, he's, just, he's beautiful. But it, now it's fucked with their perception. I've had women just turn around and snap at me. And say, what the fuck is wrong with your friend? Is he retarded? You know, people start heckling him. Start making fun of him. He has to live with this every day. He's been celibate 
for about seven years and not by choice. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of things outside of men's control and yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a stigma that men carry on them now and it's not right because there's nothing wrong with them. You know, they're, they're seen as a, I don't know, a loser or as a weak person. And of course they internalize that. They can't help but do it. And I mean, a lot of people look the other way. If you look at loneliness as an actual epidemic for men, it's growing. I mean, it reduces men's lifespan drastically. So I mean, you must see that in the medical field, but it's, you know, it's, it's social isolation, man. Yeah, yeah, it's the absolutely. worst, the worst uh, health outcomes in absolutely everything, anything, mm. anything you think about, even yeah. chest infections, um, which you use antibiotics for, right? You have mm. a regime to treat, but if you're, if you have social isolation, mm. you'll do worse, right? Yeah, it's kind of like your body is not responding as much. You're not getting all the good feel hormones. Your body's almost at a constant state of depression in a way. Um, and you know, I've argued this point in, in MGTOW before and they told me, you know, uh, Vention is for example, living on his own and he seems happy. You know, do you think that loneliness is, uh, is that bad for men? And Vention is not lonely. He's, he's not 100% of the time just by himself. No. Uh, of, of, he isn't. He finds his way. He goes out with people, I'm presuming. He does things that he enjoys. I mean, I've seen videos with him and there were other men there and he was engaging with those men. So no one is actually doing well if he's on his own, on, mm. just by himself. This monk almost kind of like idea. Even monks, man, they, they don't do things just by themselves. No, no. All right. Even if they do, if they even if they go into a fucking cave and spend a month there, they have in their minds, in the back of their minds, that there, you know, there are so many monks and they're doing the same thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're never really truly a hundred percent alone. I mean, a certain level of loneliness, like you know, when life is getting too much, just so that you can reevaluate, reflect. Uh, understand yourself and move forward with whatever shit you know life has bestowed upon you <laughs> yeah. and and understand your participation your involvement and whatever you know your the role that you played in, in ending up in all that shit that's valid but yeah. that's you preparing yourself to go back into society to get back into the game let's say and um, the thing that you said about you know um, involuntary celibacy i'm presuming we're talking about tflers as well right and um yeah th there are extreme handicaps that prevent men from doing things and i remember i spoke to guys who've sent me their life stories and i think i have a couple of them on on my on my that red pill moment series that i have on the channel and yeah. and it's difficult for me to tell them you know to, it's difficult to not feel sorry for their situation but then again i don't want to m promote this sorry feeling because i don't and like you with your friend, for example, I'm, I'm sure you don't hang out with him because you feel sorry for him. You hang out with him because, you know, you dig the guy, you have fun with him, you know. Sure. Um, what else is there? I, I mean, I don't think um, feeling, feeling sorry for a person helps that person at not all. Not at all. Not at all. And I, I, oh man, I remember this situation. I was a medical student. I mean, a third year medical student. And there was this guy who, uh, who had lung cancer, right? And we're talking end stage lung cancer. And um, they just announced the news. And I, I felt sorry for him, right? And I, uh, and I stayed there because he was telling me his life story. Man, he lived fucking amazing life, right? <laughs> he was telling me about all his trips, everything that he did in his life. And I'm like, you know what? I think what you need is go and get this, um, these cigarettes, they're called Black Devil. I mean, they're amazing. You need to get the ones with chocolate and there are some with vanilla flavor. Man, they're the best ones that I've ever tried. And the guy was just like looking at me and he's like, I'm like, what? You already have lung cancer. I mean, you're not going to get any more. <laughs> and we started laughing. And then I saw him. Uh, like a couple of days later and he told me yeah i found a friend in denmark and he's 
purchasing those cigarettes that you told me and he's getting them over. I mean, there is no point in feeling sorry for someone. A life exists as long as it exists. And then, you know, whatever shitty hand you were dealt with, and I think it was RBK who said it best, you know. Uh, I've been given lemons and I need to make lemonade, right? And you just need to make the best out of your situation. Yeah. And I think everyone can do that. Everyone. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not living life and waiting for the end, expecting the bitter end or, you know, when death will nicely take you away. And then all the suffering will finish. Because what you're doing is a very, 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 very slow suicide. Um, it's, it's about understanding that, uh, because I even spoke to a guy who had, uh, who by the sounds of things almost has a limited lifespan. And I, I spoke to him and I'm like, dude, okay. Yeah. You've been dealt a horrible hand, but you take life by the hands and you just live it. You live the way that you can and the way that you want to live. And I, women respond to that, I, I think. I mean, I, I find that they respond to that. And even if they ridicule you, I mean, fuck them, man. I mean, it's giving the, the middle finger. And I mean, it's easier for me to say that. It's easier maybe, I mean, from what I understand, you're much better looking than me. And that's the thing, right? I, <laughs> when guys, when I met friends in real life and I have friends who are much better looking than me and I've slept with with women a lot, <laughs> a lot hotter than me and that's because I don't care I don't yeah. care my my value for me comes from me what I believe about me and no one else's opinion is going to invalidate me in any way and Stardust calls me a megalomaniac in a way that I have delusions of grandiose whatever Right. Um, but but I want I, I, I'm secure in who I am. Right. Sure. With my limitations and whatever limitations I recognize. Sure, I'll fix them. Hopefully I'll hit the gym because uh, I really let myself go. But um, yeah, it, I, I think women respond to a lot of things. Man, I've never seen my apps. I don't think I have apps. Right. I'm sure that they're somewhere. Well, it takes a lot of touching, right? But it doesn't matter. I know it doesn't matter because I've lived it, right? It would make things a lot easier. Maybe I'll get the occasional chick that would want to take pictures with me or something. But at, if I don't want to fix something, I don't fix it. If I if 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 something is not you know just something that I want to do for myself, I just don't do it. Um, and and it's. It's kind of how I, I want to live my life. And I, I don't know. I don't know, especially with true force, loneliness and... Well, it's, it's um, coming to the point. I mean, what you're expressing here is that you have a good, um, you have a good relationship with self, with your yes. own self. You know, you, you know who you are. You know what you want. Most men don't. That's the thing. And when you're in that, and like I spoke before about sort of being in a survival mode, because um, that's what loneliness is. I mean, it... It puts your body into a high alert state, and your, your your body increases its cortisol, you know, production, all the rest. That you know all the physiological you know, yeah. responses that men men go through in the state. So you start seeing everything around you as a threat, rather than you know, uh, you know sources of compassion or, or people that you can work with to, to build up support networks and, and create opportunities. Um, so when you, when you're in that sort of that high alert stage, that kind of survival mode. Everything around you is going, it's a source of hurt or source of potential hurt. So it's yeah, it's it's changing that that physiology. It's it's changing that mindset. Um, so I mean, and they've internalised that dialogue. So they believe that they're somehow inadequate, that mm -hmm. they're not deserving. Um, and I mean, for a lot of men that are that have grown up, I mean, this these are the messages that they've been force fed. Um, and it comes to the point where they're still getting all that. That feedback externally. I, I've got I've got mates that won't go out to restaurants or cafes. I say why not? And they say why the fuck should I go to a restaurant to pay women to treat me like shit? Because that's their experience. They they'll go to a restaurant or cafe and the wait staff they'll look down on them. It's I've seen it happen to men. It's <laughs> and they've got a point. You know it's this perception that we have of men. Um, and why does society, I mean, really are looked down on. They're, they're seen as second-class citizens. So I, I can understand that. 
but it's it's about moving out of that and it's about you know fostering that relationship with yourself so you stop looking for sort of external validation you have to look internally and it's that's a hard process and like i say it's about facing your weakness facing your vulnerability and using that as a springboard but i i mean this thing that you said about like cafes and stuff i don't know i mean um maybe a bit of too much goodness for people is a bad thing. I mean, I'm a vindictive son of a bitch at times, right? It's, I, I, I am, come on. Um, can you, can, <laughs> if someone's doing something to me and it's treating me in a, in a certain way and I don't like it, man, you know, I'll, I'll put things in their food. I'll do things and the joke will just be for me. Yeah, I'm a mean bastard, but, right? um, and I, I'll, the joke will just be for me. So as long as, <laughs> as I, I don't, people will treat you like shit people will backstab you but you can always do your own thing you can always like come up on top if you want to if you want to live that kind of life mm. you don't have to be the loser in every situation and you don't even there are no winners there are no losers we all end up going in the same place and decomposing away right so i don't allow anyone else to define it all right and that's that's my my point of view um and these things were not actually taught to me by my my father. Th these things were taught to me by my mother, because women have an an amazing kind of like uh, you call it female solipsism in a way. They're very selfish fucking creatures. They are. I mean, it's amazing what they will the rationalizations they create in their heads in order to <laughs> to do things. For me, I can't do that. Right? I can't do it to that extent. I try but it doesn't always work as that. So I need to do something more practical. Maybe it will be jizzing with their burger. Who knows, right? Maybe I'll, I touch some, I mean, it, it can, I know it's getting very disgusting right now. I know, and as if I'm invalidating uh, the point, but what I'm saying is that you can always do something. Yeah. You, at every point you have a choice and you can either accept what, what shit someone serves to you or whatever shitty situation you're left with mm -hmm. or you can just do something to change it even when it's happening you always have a choice i all i i truly believe that you don't have a choice when you're younger when you're a child when people are responsible for you etc and all those things you take with you for the rest of your life but after a certain point you realize that you're the adult you're the person that needs to take care of you and no one else will and you need to define that reality for yourself. And sorry if, about the very disgusting and disturbing images. I'm sh you told me before. Why, why, that don't you just, why don't you just crack an egg in the air filter of the car? That would do the same <laughs> thing. You don't have to jizz in the booger. Well, who, who knows, man? I mean, I, I, I don't like the... the... <laughs> the, the egg in the car smell stays for a long, long time, man. The other I prefer thing, that you know... than someone jizzing in my burger. <laughs> Well, you can, you know, you can do the old uh, tea bag trick when, you know, when they're sleeping, you can do whatever, man. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I told you this before. I mean, I came from a really broken culture. I mean, you either had to, to kind of like survive or you would just break. And, and many, many guys broke. I think I broke, I survived broken in a way, <laughs> if that That's... makes any sense. It's like they say, uh, I can't remember who coined this quote, but it said, um, he said, active evil is better than passive good. Mm. Yeah, and mm. if you look at it logically, I mean, anything that a man does is construed as evil anyway, so fuck it. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, we, we never get to see that or get to know that, that side of ourselves. You know, um, it, 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 yeah, I can understand women, other, other people, they, they don't construe what they do as evil because, I mean, do you eat meat? Yeah. Amazing yeah. Do you like stuff. Do you like chicken? Yeah. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> you like you like what? chicken? Yeah. 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 Do you eat dog? Uh, I like dogs. No. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you eat dog? God, someone there's a, no, there's a process there. There's a justification why you won't <laughs> eat that dog. But if you were in the wild and you were starving, I'll and the only dog. yeah, you'd eat a dog because why? You're justified. You're a human. He's an animal. Your life takes precedence. But mm -hmm. if you served up dog border collie to your friends one night, I mean, they'd see you 
is yeah, the personification of something that's you know not very positive, I guess. But um, yeah, I mean, w when it comes to taking in feedback from other people um, in regards to our actions or our perspectives or what have you, whether that person deems what we've done is you know bad or less than positive, whatever, we have to be able to take on what other people say without anger and without deflection. Hmm. And when it comes to women, how can they do that if men don't even first mouth the words to say it? Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, people get caught in the same cycles. You know, you can take the cycle of abuse. You've seen it with parents. They'll, they'll recycle it. They'll get caught in the same behavior. Um, they'll start abusing. They'll start abandoning. But, yeah, you know, sometimes they reflect after the fact and realize that they've repeated the same behavior of a parent or that they've committed a crime and, you know, they felt justified in the act. Because they'll go through the same process, you know. They'll they'll blame the victim. They'll they'll call their own actions moral. They'll they'll blame fucking environmental conditions. They could blame economic conditions. They blame authority, you know, fucking pigs, whatever. It it, it fosters an us versus them mentality. And if you look at women, how many messages they've been fed, um, you know, they're, they're propped up with a sense of entitlement. But even that with women, you know. Men look at them and say, oh, well, they feel entitled and all the rest of it, and they feel that they're better than us and all the rest of it. Well, what we're sort of missing here is a female perspective. Because if you actually sit down and talk to women, you scratch underneath the surface. Like, you, you start, you try an experiment. You could sit across from a woman and say, okay, I'm going to sketch your impression of yourself, physically, what you look like. She's going to tell you that she looks a hell of a lot worse than, than how she's perceived by other people. You know, it's this feeling of inadequacy. And of course, we've got mass media marketing and all the rest of it propping that up. The majority of women that I know, you know feel completely inadequate. So what happens? They bolster up that, that false sense of bravado, just like men do. And it, it leads to this, this just vacuum inside themselves where they feel they need to get everything external. It's not that they feel that they're entitled to it. It's that they're feeling they're trying to just you know, uh, fill up this chasm inside of themselves. So externally, uh, they, they have to seek things, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I agree. I agree with with what you said. I mean, when, when you're having that conversation, I do think that women, the majority of women, I think the better looking the woman is, the more bitchy she is. And I mean, PUAs call that the bitch shield and all this shit. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they, well, you, they you know all about that. You watch all those of videos. Course. <laughs> of course, of course. Man, I, I mean, I, I'm, I came from that arena. That, that's kind of the arena. Sure, a lot that of guys did. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when I, when I, when you have a proper conversation with them and, and you know when you have a proper conversation because they get so uncomfortable they, they it's almost like a sitting fetal position that they that they adopt when when they're having a real conversation with you um, then you see underneath the surface and you're right but I think women do one thing very well because of this kind of like appearance that they want to have for the for the outside world I think women are a lot better than men are in expressing what they want, oh, certainly. right? I, I want this, right? They will say, it, they will phrase it out loud. Like I disagree with you because of this, and it's bullshit most of the time, or you know, it's not going to be something great. But they at least express it. I think if men, like you say, if men are hurt in a certain way, or they disagree with whatever someone might say to them, they'll keep that. They'll digest it. They'll keep it inside of them, and they'll let it fester. And it will fester and fester and fester and become like a really ugly part of them. I think it's much better to almost explode. It's, because that's what we think initially um, about expressing a bit of anger with someone or like phrasing your opinion out loud. Uh, and it's something that, you know, it's being advertised that oh, men should not be doing that. And I'm not saying beat someone or like no. just tell them out loud that you disagree with what they're saying and tell them out loud that what they're doing right now it, it's something that you do not approve yeah. i mean phrase your opinion say it out loud even if it makes everyone fucking uncomfortable right in the entire table yeah. and stand up for things that you do not you know if someone for example and you said that actually uh, how many times did you did you sit quietly when someone else was dehumanizing the man in front of you. Why don't you speak up? If you disagree with something, speak up. Be yep. 
the thoughts in your in your head and you start to when you do it once twice three times however many times it is it's it's kind of like living your own truth and you become that truth mm. eventually you become that person that you want to be um and i'm not saying that i'm perfect in any way i just said some disgusting things that i would do to people but i would tell them afterwards and you just ate jizz i'm sorry man you just really pissed me off yeah, yeah. but I, I will do that <laughs> i will do that I, i'll be like that um and um i want to be kind of like aggressive in my opinions and and it's weird that being open and straight about things that you want to you know sure. you believe is almost seen as aggression nowadays because it's expected yeah, yeah, yeah. you will filter in all situations yeah. well it's it's interesting it's um and and what you're saying is is the healthiest way to express it i mean i've stated this before even if you're in a situation that doesn't feel right express yourself even if you don't know exactly what you're about to say or what have you it's a healthy way of putting it across yeah you know, it's it's in a controlled setting you're you're not exhibiting rage or the rest of it but the issue with a lot of men is and i'll just talk specifically say about men that haven't faced a, a great deal of trauma you know just the average joe on the street i mean the average joe on the street that they, they are existing in a perpetual state of guilt yeah and real self-loathing that they're, they're emotionally dead and when a man gets triggered you know, where, where he feels that he's being threatened or what have you a lot of those men because of those things they don't have a way of processing it and they feel scared they feel fear and inside each man when he has a moment of rage you know is that little child that needs to be protected so what happens yeah he goes on the attack he needs to take his power back and that anger reaction i mean it, it stops any further introspection and of course you, you never get to identify what sparked the reaction in the first place and i mean you know that 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 need that that need to to lash out in anger what happens i mean if you if you're feeling guilty if, if you're loathing yourself you have that, that feeling of self-loathing all of that gets turned inwards so what does he do he reaches for a way to deflect a, a way to numb his pain it could be alcohol it could be anything uh, and he shuts everything down he shuts down his emotions and from there he just justifies every action that he makes from there on in and like i say he can hold up to the world this badge say this is my suffering uh, it's, and he could say it's, it's something that nobody else is, understands and you never get into the cause root of that problem have you ever seen that show um the biggest loser um no is it like prime time tv yeah, it's an American show about overweight people. They go on that game show. Oh yes, way. I've I've watched it and I've seen YouTube videos about it. It's brilliant, brilliant yeah. television. <laughs> it's Star it's Stardust's favorite um favorite program. <laughs> yeah, he's, I've seen the pictures. He's got his big mama fetish, but um, <laughs> but on, on that show, I mean, they push these people so hard. They, these people work out for like six or seven hours a day, and um, they take all kinds of diuretics and all the rest of it. They really risk their health. And I think about 90% of the people on that show, uh, they put the weight back on and more because those, those core issues were never addressed. They never got down to the core of why they started eating in the first place. Was it trauma? Was it these feelings of insecurity or the rest of it? So, you know, you first have to get to that core issue, but how can you do that with men when they're living in, in the state of guilt and all the rest of it, this, this constant state of suppressing their own emotions, where society tells them that they can't express their emotions if they do, they're weak and they'll be judged accordingly. It's, and they've got peer pressure from other men. They'll be judged by women. It's, man, it's just a, it's a pressure cooker. But is it weakness, man? I mean, we, we talk about stoicism all of the time and I, I, I'm trying very hard to understand what stoicism might be because i mean i come across collected i mean to patients at least i come across as collected you know and all these things but i in in real life how the way that i i behave in myself if i feel something right you feel something at that point right a bit of anger a bit of disapproval a bit of sadness or whatever if you express that feeling and you don't let it fester on you first of all you identify what is the cause of the feeling right second of all if it's anger that you're expressing then it doesn't 
end up becoming resentment to yourself and then rage or whatever it might become. It never, it never becomes rage and you're, you always appear to the outside world as being collected. For example, um, look at someone um, who is a CEO or, or a leader or whatever, you know, someone who's on top of a company. For he sees something that someone else has done. He expresses his disapproval straight away, right? Straight away. His emotion is never like exceptional anger. And then you just move on and you deal with things. And the person seems to be collected. The, the problem is when people express emotions that don't appear to be appropriate to the situation. And, and, and the thing is, what is not appropriate to a situation? When, for example, you see someone raging or someone who's angry and you know that what that person is angry about cannot possibly be because you, I don't know, overcook the steak, right? It, it just doesn't compute because people are not that, you know, emotionally unstable. Some of them are and people have created disorders out of them, uh, but people are generally not that emotionally unstable. There are many feelings that are built and expressed as one large burst of emotion. And neither the person expressing the emotion nor anyone else knows what's happening. And I think a much better way in being more in control about what's happening in your life is actually expressing the emotions that you're having rather than letting them, you know, stay inside of you. You're feeling angry? Say it. You know, and it's it's just a small pinch of anger. It is like a pinch of salt. It, that's all it is. You never feel full rage. That I, I've never seen a single person that had full rage out of something that happened to them, unless something horrible has happened. It doesn't. It it just does. It's not a natural process. You'll have anger, and then you'll have rage. You'll have sadness, and then you'll have depression. It it just doesn't go very naturally if you express your emotions if you live your emotions if you accept those emotions i mean that's just me i, I haven't trained in psychotherapy or any way but i I'm, i mean i'm i'm a weird kid i mean that's that's my interpretation of how i experience the world sure sure well i i i've, I've seen it i've seen it go from zero to 100 and you know click of your fingers um, but that's just a defensive strategy it's still a deflection from the hurt and the vulnerability that they've experienced but these are young men that have come from incredibly abusive backgrounds hmm. um but you know i mean it, it comes down to the same thing i mean if you don't recognize the triggers uh, if you can't connect the dots then you're going to self-sabotage and you're going to stay in a victim mindset and the thing is if you want to move forward you have to suffer so you can feel again and no one's going to help you unless you first help yourself. So, you know, I've, I've talked about it before. You, you, if you feel like you're losing control, good. That's the first step. You know, it's, it's terrifying, but facing that fear is how you move forward. It's the only way forward. It is, it is true. And I mean, those people that you just said that they lose control, they don't lose control over that small thing that happened. There oh, are no. so many other things that happen Absolutely. and they're just reliving all of it in mm -hmm. that one moment. And it is the most terrifying thing. I mean, I've used my channel and one of the criticisms coming from Stardust was that I use my channel as a, as a cathartic mechanism for me. Mm -hmm. And I've done that because I've worked through my own issues and I've spoken them out loud, you know, for other people to see. It's kind of like acknowledging them. What is it? The first step <laughs> is acknowledging that you have a problem. And then I tried to do it in that way. And I work through the process that, you know, possibly only works for me. Uh, but, but it's understanding what happened to you, reliving those experiences in a way, because you are reliving them. Oh. And it's horrible. Horrible yeah. going through uh, things that may have happened to you when you were younger or, you know, um, if you went through periods of depression or harmed yourself in any way, they're very difficult things to actually relive. And I think people are scared of reaching that vulnerable state again. But it's understanding that right now where you are, you're safe and you can disengage yeah. from that moment. Um, I don't know how, how easy it is to tell people to do this. And there is no pill. I can't give anyone 
any pill and I don't yeah. know LSD pops to mind mm. uh, that, <laughs> that might help them relieve um, these memories and it's and it's hard work that you need to do for yourself yeah. and we need to acknowledge that yeah and everything I mean you me people that have gone through you know really abusive backgrounds uh, you know the experience triggers every single day you know there was a certain something that will set somebody off and it can send them off into a spiral you know, a spiral of addiction and just numbing behaviors and you pull that someone up on that you you point it out to them their first initial reaction is going to be anger you know that's their shield that's again that's their protective buffer so it's it's a whole host of, of deeply rooted psychological issues that you really have to scratch and claw and, and, and dig your way into to actually get to but um, mm. yeah, yeah it's, it's, I mean it's, it's so much easier just to punish yourself than to attempt <laughs> to punish a world that gives, doesn't give two fucks about you I mean it's mm, absolutely exactly why vent out and not inwards right <laughs> yeah and when you self punish I mean it brings you a sense of empowerment I mean I've known a lot of people that have you know, have been cutters who have cut their flesh that have done all kinds of horrible shit to themselves. Um, and in that moment, they've got power because they didn't have power when, when they were younger in whatever situation. Mm. So, yeah. mm. I, I actually saw um, someone um, at work uh, who was doing that and he was, mm. he was a colleague as well. And I, and I sat him down um, and, I, and I spoke to him and I'm like, look, I don't know. I don't claim to know what you've been through. I don't claim to understand what you've been through. But right now what you're doing is just punishing yourself and you might feel good for taking control out of that situation. It's kind of like punishing the, kind of like scraping the thoughts out of you. I don't know how to yeah. understand it completely. I know it's cathartic when they're doing it, um, but you're not the one that did that, that did this to you. And right now, this has happened. You need to revisit it, see it, accept it, and then you can move on. And all, all the things that you've done on yourself, they will eventually heal. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the thing, seeing that anything that's ever happened to you can heal eventually. Yeah. It, you will eventually come back to a state of wellness. Maybe not you know, with everything as attached as, you know, and functional as it used to be. But even that, once you're better, you can work on that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's interesting, um, people that do self mutilate or, or do that kind of behavior. And I, I've seen it in the prison environment as well. I go oh, get the living shit kicked out of them by, by a group of guys or whatever. And after, after the act, he's just, he's the sweetest guy I've ever met. You know, because he's given himself permission to then take care of himself. It's the only reprieve he gives himself. And it's the same with people that self-mutilate. You know, that, that process that they have, this process of aftercare, it's very elaborate. Mm -hmm. This is the only time when they'll take care of themselves and really look after themselves. And it, it brings them so much relief. Because during the actual act of cutting, um, you know, people have related to me that they're emotionally numb. But it's that process afterwards where, you know, they... They allow themselves to take care of themselves. And it's an addictive behavior. They will mm -hmm. clean the skin. Yep. Uh, they will clear, clean the instruments that they will use and they will start it. And they know that once they do it, they will feel better. And it's kind of like an addict preparing heroin in a way. It's, it's almost like that, isn't it? Um, you get your instruments ready and then you engage in that act. And then they feel like they're present. Again, they're in the moment, they're in the zone, you know, life is not as shit as it used to be. And that's one of the ways that people express their emotions. It's, it's one of the things that you said that, you know, it's better to turn inwards and punish yourself. It's, people can do that and it can have external kind of like proof that it's happening. Yeah, uh, or you can do it internally. And with those people it's very difficult to see at times that they're going through it because they have this mask and i keep i kept talking about masks initially on the channel and that's why i use the the fucking avatar that we need to take that mask off show ourselves to the world and no matter how weird it is you know black and white there <laughs> yeah. well here's, here's something i wanted to ask you because you'd see it quite a bit in the hospital environment um 
when I, I came out of a coma, I couldn't walk, all the rest of it. Um, it took me a long time to rehab and, and get my functionality back. But during that period, that's where I found focus for the first time. I'd, I'd never been so focused. You know, that, fuck it, I'm going to walk. No matter what it takes, I'm going to fucking walk and do what I have to do. Um, but you must see that in the hospital environment all the time. People who have just faced just awful heinous shit, you know, either to themselves or, or to family members, but they, they must, their mentality must shift into this, this, this focus, in which they're just completely 100% focused on, you know, rehabilitating their bodies or doing what they have to do for the loved ones. Do you, do you see that quite often? Yeah. Yeah, it does happen. And it doesn't happen to everyone. That That is the thing. Mm. It doesn't happen to everyone or to that extent. I mean, I've seen, you've seen people that come out of strokes or whatever, and some of them do brilliantly. And that's why uh, antidepressants are actually used, just to motivate uh, people who, you know, just go down the path. Because there are, there are two ways of thinking about things. I, I mean, that's how I see it. It's kind of like focusing on the loss focusing on the loss and that your life will never be the same ever again. And then you lose that brief window that you have in order to rehabilitate yourself or focusing on the next step, the next day, moving your toe or moving your fingers and then just moving your hand as a whole one step at a time. And it's, and it's that motivation. You have that motivation. It's kind of like it's a survival instinct at its best. And it yeah. doesn't exist in all of us. I, I don't think it exists in all of us. And I think a bit of social support does help a bit. Too much social support sometimes doesn't help, right? And sometimes social isolations help some people or, you know, it's, uh, uh, it varies. But I, I find the best thing is to have a few people, a few people that will not give you any shit right you need to yeah. do this you need to keep forward you know this is what you need to do and that's why people are trained in that field and they get paid good money man the physiotherapists and stuff who are good at their job they're the people who will push you at yeah. to the point that you want to vomit yeah, and you that, will yeah. do it <laughs> yeah 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 i've met quite a few like that but it's it's interesting it's it's like i say it's always, always goes back to the capacity to be adaptive um, I think that's, if somebody has that, I think it's inbuilt. If they have that ability, they can pretty much ride their own ticket in life. Um, doesn't mean that they're going to be, you know, financially successful in the, uh, in this big scheme of things, but in terms of a personal level, um, you know, how they define success, I think they're always going to be a success, um, in their own lives and, you know, have a, have a good relationship with self. But, um, yeah, that was the first time that I sort of I came to understand the meditative process and getting in touch with my inner self. Um, I, I, I first came to it sort of through boxing because you know I did a lot of boxing when I was younger, and that that philosophy of boxing has been passed down from generation to generation, from man to man. And if it could be summarised in a, a modern modern philosophy, it'd be something known as spira, you know, synchronisation, power, energy, rhythm, activation. It's focusing internally, it's focusing on your physiology as well. It's getting in tune with your body and your mind. But um, yeah, man, it's just, there's so many things in life. I don't know if it's it's been your experience, but so many things that have just been right there in your face and you haven't realized it until you've gone through the shit. You just wish somebody had smacked you around. There were, there were, <laughs> were times when people just laid it out to me and said, you know, this is the way the things are. You, I think 10 years later, fuck, they were right. Why didn't I listen? Yeah, yeah, it's all yeah, there. You, yeah. you even established the process to begin with, but you didn't listen. It's, oh, fuck. It's because you didn't need it. It wasn't necessary. But when it was necessary, the knowledge was there. Or, um, I mean, in a way, when they were teaching us medicine, they were like, look, you're not going to remember everything. You're not going to remember all the diseases. You're not going to remember all of the shit uh, that you need to learn. You're not going to learn all the medications that you're ever going to use. But you'll know where to find it. And I, and I think our brains are almost kind of like libraries. Yeah. And there's so many things, man. I mean, you, you do one thing and then there is another thing. There is something else that you can learn. There is something else that you can adopt. And there, I, I think there is no single absolute truth or sing, one single absolute ideology that would work. Because like I said, my, my way of doing things and I'm, you know, me being a bit vindictive and me being like this and like that, you know, it's different to your way. 
but you know your way works for you my way works for me and i think of books uh, theories about things and all that they worked for the people that that wrote them that came up with the concept but you will adapt it just a tiny bit you know just a little bit you let some a bit of you in it and it will just fit right in and and the words of other people that never made sense before they will come back to you in the moments that you need them the most <laughs> and that that is the beauty of of actually having you know a thinking brain you know out of an evolved ape was the thinking ape <laughs> but it works it works quite well it's a very simple organ you know it keeps a lot of information in most of it abstract and scattered around but when it's yeah. needed yeah. it will bring that shit together as let long me, as you keep focus let me ask you um like because uh, i i i don't know when you come into the, the sort of the online sphere i'll just i'll, I'll bring it back to the sort of the online sphere because we're on it but um <laughs> what what what's what's been your because i see a lot of guys coming online and they stumble across material and like myself i was in a state of transition you know i yeah I, I looked at barbarossa's videos first off and i was actually quite angry at them i've stated that before <laughs> because you know he was, he was reflecting a reality back to me that i knew was true and i couldn't refute it and his, his work was just phenomenal and i had to admit that too which irritated me even more so I had to keep keep coming back to it. So I was in a process of transition. Um, when you first came online, I mean, what what sort of, in a rough way, what's been your your journey so far? How has your perceptions shifted from when you originally came online? Hmm, good question. <laughs> yeah, has it when shifted, I say, or was it still in the uh, same? Um, I it has shifted. I'm look who I am right now, and um. A P, people tell me that I haven't changed in a way and I haven't changed internally who I am as a person because I, I always like to be pretty much the same uh, in a way but it, a lot of things have changed inside of me mm. uh, in a way so when I came I came out of a relationship first of all and it was man it was a good relationship it wasn't horrible in any way but it didn't work right so I it didn't work because I lost interest. She eventually lost interest. It wasn't horrible. She didn't stab me. She didn't take my children. I didn't get her pregnant. Nothing like that. And but I I, I was doing a lot of reading before I I, I you know um, I went into this relationship. I had knowledge from the PUA scene and all of these things. And um, it just it, it it was shit, man. It was all shit. It was all bullshit. I, I realized that it was all bullshit when I was reading it, but it, it gave me an idea about pre how women think in a way. And when when I figured things out for myself and I got into a relationship and then I realized how things worked uh, and it still didn't click despite doing everything right in my head. I just needed answers. I, I didn't know what I was searching or why I was searching all of these things. It, it wasn't coming from a feeling of being hurt. I, was, I wasn't hurt from the point of view of a woman. I was hurt by, you know, how the world worked in a way. Yeah, <laughs> it yeah. just didn't, it didn't make sense to me. Um, and I came across Rollo's blog, Rollo Tomasi, who I spoke to, and I know he's a PUA and people don't, I don't give a shit. For me, massive respect, right? So um, I found him and then some guy was talking about MGTOW and I'm like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> you can't even, M-G-T-O-W and they're like MGTOW, I'm like, you can't even spell that, right? It wasn't a great acronym is my first thought. And then you your video was actually shown to me by my then flatmate right. your video the disposable male still my favorite of yours mm -hmm. um was the first video that someone showed me from the from the community and it just fucked with me i just went like oh fuck i i, I thought we were awesome you know i thought men were awesome you know <laughs> what, what the fuck is happening here yeah. and it just let me down this strange rabbit hole and especially when I came across emotional videos and I realized I realized uh, about how I didn't deal with you know things that happened to me when I was younger with my father being a bit abusive and stuff not a bit he was very <laughs> very abusive um, and 
and you know relationships broken relationships beforehand uh, the nature of women the nature of men um and i thought man i thought i cracked i had cracked all of this shit i thought i understood all of these things before but i never turned the microscope on myself i never turned the microscope to look into the minute details and once I've done that, once I've understood everything, I started raging. <laughs> I did rage a bit, and I, would, I thankfully I did that before I did I did videos. Man, I fucked indiscriminately, horribly. Um, I you fuck despite... a girl with a uh, tattoo on her neck. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know that. I told you about that. Yeah, how many I, messages I... I still get from guys. To... <laughs> hey, what's the um? What, what is a what is a woman? With a tattoo on the back of her neck, have in common with a bathroom with a magazine in it. What? They both give you something to read while you're in the shitter. <laughs> no, go on, continue. You were talking. So I, 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 it was kind of like raging, and I was, I, I, I don't know, and and I felt, and I, and I see this going through with my current flatmate who's coming through the same truths right now because I, I think he's becoming a MGTOW himself. He's definitely into the red pill and he's just like hating shit. You know, when you realize how things really work and you're sleeping with women and you're hoping, hoping you'll be proven wrong. Like you're running your own experiments and, yeah, you're, yeah. and you're hoping that things will not be like you, you want them to be. And eventually you just find this strange place where you understand that you kind of like punishing yourself and you're kind of like causing damage to other people in the process and i i, I paused and i took a long break um for myself even uh, even recently i took a long break with like i took i think six months without engaging with any females altogether um without doing anything other than just doing pure self-reflection nothing else and I had no interest. I had no interest uh, in talking to women. I had no interest in even in talking to other guys. I just needed to speak my mind, figure stuff out for myself and come to a bliss state, which I realized when, when I realized that, you know, that was an impossibility. It's just, you know, it's reality, accept the reality and move on you know come to terms with things i stopped hating female nature i stopped hating men i stopped hating sim you know simps as they call them or blue pillars and it feels nice i i don't know it feels nice i feel motivated to do things again um yeah. i want to move on like if mctow uh, as as a label and i said that recently to a hang in a hangout as a label i'm so thankful to all the knowledge everything that he has given me and i and i consider myself to be a mictow as it, as it stands a label and what it describes i consider myself to be a mictow but even if people tell me i'm not or i'm not or whatever and even if someone substantially proves to me that i'm not a mictow or whatever it doesn't matter to me man i'm comfortable at the <laughs> at where i am right now and it's a very weird thing yeah to to find peace in all the shit that's happening around. Like I, 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 I imagine myself sitting in a, I don't know, in a pit of fire and, you know, just going like, yeah, okay. Yeah. This is what it is. I'm going to have a beer. I, I'm going to go and enjoy myself. And I, I don't mind. I don't mind. Well, it's, it's, it's a natural, it's, natural process that you've gone through. I mean, you stopped living like a victim. You stopped blaming the world and everyone in it. You know, you saw the way that things were. So, okay, well, I've accepted this. I've accepted this reality. You know, I was angry. But now you understand your anger. You understand your triggers. And mm -hmm. you're not dwelling on, on thoughts of, of ways to gain control or hurt people. It's at that point that you can forgive. That you can let go of the pain. You can let go of the hurt and the anger. No, I don't even feel pain. I, I don't feel pain. I, yeah, I yeah, expect you've come things to... Terms to... With it, yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of like the natural aches you get with, you know, if you sleep uh, in a certain way or if you're at a, after a certain age, you will feel certain aches. You expect them. <laughs> They're not that bad. Yeah. It's okay. That's how I wake up from now on. That's what it feels like. Yeah, it's good. That's the healthy way of coming to it, you know. Um, what was I going to talk about? Something to do with women. 
Um, let's go. They they miss us. We have to talk about. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I don't because uh, I mean, it's such a so much focus has been put on. I know you've come under a great deal of criticism as well. Um, yeah, I, I guess it's interacting with females now. It's I know for a lot of men, it causes a great deal of distress. And a great deal of distress because um, I, I think one of your videos you, you're talking about, Matt. I, I'm, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it was about um, you know, holding back or, or not, not displaying your emotion or not. I I, I, I don't. I did I, I, I did I did this video right. Yeah. Uh, and I was uh, Nico's guide to dating. Is it one of those videos where I'm doing my PUA thingy? Um, right. <laughs> so, so I, I, it's about not over displaying emotions in a way. It's sure. not about not showing your emotions, but I, I was, I was, mm. I think there is a time and place about everything. And, and I just said, you need to be honest about your emotions. But if you, what I said was sitting with a woman and telling her your entire life story in one sitting yeah. and over expressing your vulnerability. I mean, why? Who does that? You don't do that with another guy. You don't do that with a person you've never met in your life. You okay. never become as vulnerable uh, as that with anyone. If, if, if you do that with people that you love, that you know, that you you know they you trust, you, really really close friends of yours, and you don't even do it in one sitting. You do it in multiple sittings. So uh, it's about the weakness inside of you. And I think I think. You put it best, I think. It's weakness doesn't come from displaying your emotions. Weakness comes from withholding your emotions and then letting them explode. Either in, and I've done that in the past where I, I was with women and uh, it would be like verbal diary of everything that's ever happened to me, and I, and and I would expect you know a woman to hug me, and pet me, and it just doesn't happen. That it doesn't happen, and it's not a it's not even a nice way of doing things or a healthy way of doing things for you. Sure. It's always it's always best to instead of going through massive trauma because it is in a way reliving that trauma again, all of it. Yeah. It's better to do it in steps. Everything every everything you do in steps, and I'm not saying you can't be honest with women or, but you can. You have to understand that there is another person yeah. in front of you. Absolutely. I with needs as well. It, it's, it's good advice as well. I mean, it's, it's so many men that, um, you know, they bottle things up for so long and they've bought into this whole, you know, belief that women are goddesses and all the rest of it and they're kind and empathetic and all the rest of it. And they've gone for so long without, you know, displaying this this kind of emotion i know a lot of women they've related it to me that um they get with a guy and it's just like you say verbal diarrhea but it's this just onslaught of emotion and insecurity and all this just bottled up pain that gets lumped on this woman and um yeah you, you shouldn't be doing that to anyone because that, that's far too much for anyone to handle mm. um at the same time it's you know if a man doesn't do that what other avenue does he have because you know, men don't open up with one another so it's, but it's, why? Well, you know why. They, they, you know, men keep each other in line. They've been, they watch for signs of weakness. We've been indoctrinated to believe that. That's that's how we operate. We we operate in this way, but I, I don't think you you can only do it with women. I don't think you. Oh no, you absolutely, can be... absolutely. <laughs> but it's it's getting men to that point where they. Where they'd feel comfortable with opening up to another man. Um, even online, I mean, like I say, there's there's a lot of censorship going on. Um, a guy says one thing, he gets jumped on. He says he wants intimacy with a woman. Well, fuck you, you can't say that. You know, it's, hey, come on. If, if we can't even do it behind usernames on the interwebs anonymously, <laughs> how are we going to do it in real life? In, in real life, uh, and that's what I find, right? Uh, and I, I want guys to understand this. If you're, if you're going to talk real with another guy, expect that that guy will be, well, he will throw um, a homoerotic joke here and there. He will just make it slightly awkward every now and then. It, it's, it's awkward for him as well, because as awkward as you're feeling, mm. the other person is feeling as well. Because 
if, if that person is truly your friend, he will sit there and he will listen. But he will also feel, it's kind of like two people who, who've never spoken the foreign language, to, it's to each other and they're attempting to communicate with each other it's all coming out as quite awkward and they're making mistakes and they're not really communicating as they should be but you, you eventually get there and the, after a certain point and if you persevere you, you will never find understanding from a woman in the same way that you will find from another man i truly mm. believe that yeah, as gay like, as that sounds no, no, right I mean, uh, you, you, you talk to veterans i mean the guys that come back and they're traumatized they're going through hell. They'd go back at the drop of a hat. Why? Because they miss their brothers. You know, it's that bond is so powerful that they will risk their life and they go back to a war zone that will traumatize them even further. You know, it's they, they miss that brotherhood because it's the only place in society where they can where they can have that. That's how powerful it is. Yeah, and and you have guy man in in war zones like you said in horrible situations guys cry with each other, they laugh with each other, they, there are no insecurities or all the insecurities are displayed and that makes them powerful, not just as a person, that yeah. one person, but everyone together as a group, they, they feel united and it's that, that thirst that men have, yeah. being part of something, it's, it gives you security you know you even feel secure in your insecurity in a way it and, and that is the power yeah. of connection with another human being and you can't expect I, that, that is the thing i mean when i tell men that you can't expect to find that in a female not to that extent it's impossible absolutely then they tell me what is the point of you know, of looking for it. I, I, there is no point in looking for it. I'm just telling you how things are. If you don't, if this is what you want to have with a woman, then, you know, reality check, it's never going to happen. I'm sorry, but this is the reality. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Yeah. I was going to say something, I forgot what it was. Sorry, I do have verbal diarrhea. <laughs> no, I was going to say that, um, it, it's it's a shame today. I I I gave a link to that Sexodus article to um, quite a few different people, men and women, and um, the instant reaction when they started reading it was um, they said, "Oh, it just sounds bitter." I said, "Well, how can you be bitter? The author is a homosexual," and they said, "Oh, okay, yeah, I better read it again." So it's a shame that the the only time when somebody will sit down and listen to anything in regards to men or male experience is when it comes from a woman or a homosexual male. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even then, after they read the article, they turned around and said, well, it's, he must have been talking to some bit of men, you know. They just completely wrote it off. I understand the reaction, but it's, it's just a shame. Like, we're talking about brotherhood. It's how much have we lost out on? Yeah, you know, men just shut each other down constantly. They, they, won't, they won't even entertain the idea of having a brotherhood with another man. It's, we do it online too. We shut each other down. It's, it's a shame because here's a real opportunity. And it is, I think, um, the way that things are, and I mean, after a certain point, and I do understand a bit of shutting certain people out, right? I mean, if, if you're having that, you know, horrible disagreements with people, then, you know, you need to find your group of preference. And guys do that. I mean, even within groups there are subgroups and you know small gangs you know favoritism between people and that's all right you know um but you need to be able to open up if, you, if you're with within a group of people everyone dresses the same you know everyone drinks the same drinks everyone is you know being all macho all of the fucking time then no one has ever opened up to anyone and you're not within a group of friends you're within a group of acquaintances and you know your friends should like you, want to hang out with you, whether you stink, smell, look like shit, don't look like shit, uh, sleep with women, don't sleep with women, can't speak English, speak English, can't speak at all, don't speak at all, can see, cannot see, doesn't matter, right? Yeah. It's who you are and it's your value inside and men can truly do that, right? Men can truly do that with one another. The, you, you have that friend in your mind when I say this. You know that guy yeah. who perhaps no one else likes, but you love that guy, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't know why, but there is something, right? 
there is something they call it bromance just to you know gay it up a bit and make us feel uncomfortable for sharing our emotions but it's bullshit it's amazing it's nice it's noble you know touch your fellow man it feels good that's what i told people the other time just to challenge this belief that you know being in male conversation and you know speaking as we do right now is bad for you how is this bad for you you're just expressing your thoughts as freely as you will ever do in in an environment that's safe Um, and maybe MGTOW is becoming a bit toxic and I've spoken against this so many times when people are shutting down other people when people are attacking other people attacking other people's opinions I mean conversation against different points of view is brilliant and you can do that even with your really close friends you can disagree viscerally about certain points but you you respect each other therefore the disagreement never you know escapes that realm of like friendship so uh, you can find your group of preference even within MGTA and you can do that safely Uh, unfortunately I think for us (laughs) if you read the comment section you're gonna you're gonna see what people think of you (laughs) oh sure well, yeah, can't please everyone all the time, can you? <laughs> <laughs> that was your advice. You can't please everyone. Well, you can't. You know, you get used to it. But um, it's, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, everybody that I talk to, if you talk to you know, my social grouping, they'd say I talk like no one else because I talk very direct. You know, I talk about things that, that concern me. I, I talk about things that affect me emotionally. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm very open with that. And as a result, you know, men and women do open up to me all the mm. time. I mean, I, I get insights like you wouldn't believe. Even the messages I, I get on my channel. Um, guys are divulging the most personal information you could imagine. They give me their names. They, mm. They, mm. they tell me things about their lives, what they've been through. It's, I'd never share that information with anyone. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's, you allow people that opportunity to express themselves, especially men. It's so rare. That a man gets that opportunity to do that. You're a freak of nature, though, isn't it? Doesn't everyone like imagine it like this? Because I I experience it as well, right? Mm-hmm. If if someone walks from a random group or you know steps into the conversation, mm-hmm. they don't know how how you can speak like this so openly, so honestly with people. Mm-hmm. Um, and even within the group, like the relationship that you have with people in the group, people do not understand it. But that's because of the trust that you've built with people. Yeah. And it, it's, it's a nice way of living your life. It's, it's almost like everything out in the open mm. and a very honest conversation all of the time. Well, I, th- I think the most important thing you can ever do is be honest with yourself. You know, if you do that, everything flows from there. Um, mm-hmm. Who we are behind closed doors, that's you. That's the real you. You know, that, that person who, who, who cries into his hands, who who walks around his apartment naked, who, who does whatever, who, who's, who's ashamed to say different things that he does and all the rest of it. Behind closed doors, that's who you are. Embrace mm-hmm. that, you know? Live that every day. You don't need to be scared of that. We put yeah. on so many, like you say, masks. We put on pretenses, so much bravado. It's, yeah, it's endemic. <laughs> I'm surprised that you can just, uh, I mean, in, initially I was getting so angry, man. I mean, I'm I'm am a rookie, right, in this community, and and uh, I was I was going out and I would see like my mates, oh my god, just like a, a woman would approach us like Mm-mm, chest out, oh, hitting yeah. their chest. Yeah. <laughs> you, you understand straight away, and I'll be like, oh my god, here we go, fucking again, right? It it, it, it would it would annoy me. It yeah. would annoy me to the point that I would walk away. But but right now I don't care. I mean it's 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 normal. As long as their behaviors with me are going to be okay, I don't mind. Let the yeah. boys do what they're going to do. And and I think a lot of them see. I mean, all you have to do is put that idea in their heads, and yeah. they will they will see themselves how they behave and how they they are with other people. Yeah. And. It works, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, all you have to do is ask the question, why? Why are you engaging in the behavior? What, what do you hope to reap from this? And you, you get them being more introspective. Um, I've, I've had that with a lot of guys who will literally run after, up the street after women, saying, hey, what's your name? I'm so-and-so. Give me your number. 
you know, they're that, they have no idea. Um, but a lot of those guys, well, pretty much all of them have gone into relationships with females and these females treat them like shit. You know, they'll either fuck around on them or they'll be disrespectful or what have you. And these men will put up with it. Like literally, they'll know that this woman is going out and sleeping with other guys. But you see this now with so many men that they feel that they can't get anything better. So they'll settle for this. They'll settle to allow, you know, allow themselves to be abused, to be walked on. And this is what a lot of men are, are, have come to be like today. Um, you know, it, I guess when sex is so scarce as it is today because of you know, female expectations in the society we live in, that men are prepared to settle for these long-term, how they see it, deem it monogamous relationships in which they get walked on. So it's, it's, I'm saying this at, you know, with a lot of men, a lot of men. And I think, I think you're right. I think you're right. I, I mean, I said that in the in the last video. I think we've been programmed in such in such a way. And I and I tried to take an evolutionary psychology approach to it. I don't know how successful I was, but the the way that we've learned to behave, the way that we've been socialized to behave, we come across to women as being lower, mm -hmm. uh, lower level males in a way. And it's because we're not able to express ourselves. We're not able to say out loud, no, don't fucking go and sleep with someone else. It's not that difficult. It's like you can say that to your friends. You can safely express yourself with your mates. Why can you not safely express that with the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with? Um, and these people go and settle down. They get in abusive relationships. These women cheat on them, leave them, take away their children, take away their money. And then these guys are wondering why. And I, I, I want men to know before they reach that point. It's better to reach, reach this level of understanding before you go into doing anything, anything stupid with a woman. Uh, but a lot of the men, unfortunately, need to figure things out for themselves. They need to try things out for themselves. I, it's like when, when I learned about MGTOW and I had to do my own experiments <laughs> to, to prove to myself that this is actually the case rather than just take some random stranger's word for it. I, I'd r much rather they take it from, from us, from anyone else, rather than go and finding out the hard way, like many of the MGTOW guys have. And, and it's not a badge of honor to wear it's not a badge of a dishonor for that matter. It's just suffering that you will have to put up with yeah. or get over afterwards. It's, it's dealing with a situation that you shouldn't really be dealing with. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, and I feel, I mean, I felt guilty, man. I remember I felt I was feeling guilty for not being raped in a court of law and having my children taken away from me or something like that. I have no children as far as I know, but I'm, I'm saying I felt guilty when I came to this community because I almost couldn't relate to these people. Um, I felt guilty for not going through the pain that they were describing to me and they were asking me for advice. I mean, how do you deal with, with this? Um, uh, I mean, I've, I, like, uh, I think I've said this before. I, um, I used to engage so I was suffering a lot of, a lot of ad, adverse reactions mentally um, after coming out of that that coma. Um, I was just going through the whole rehabilitation thing, and I was suffering, uh, you know, from a lot of, a lot of different things at the time. But um, coming out of that, I, I started integrating into um, veterans groups, and you know, sitting across from these guys and understanding their stories and what they've been through. It was like I felt like comparing a you know a sprained ankle to a amputated leg. Yeah. So, um, but these guys just opened up to me and said, look, you know, it's, yeah, you, you didn't go through what we, we went through, but that doesn't make your pain any less viable. Yeah. And that's, that's something we need to live with. If, if someone turns around to you and says, no, fuck off, you, you don't understand my pain. All that's doing is pushing someone away. That's a deflection because it, you, you get inside this mindset that everything around you is a potential threat. Whereas you should be looking at everything around you as a possibility to build your, your support network to, as opportunities to, you know, for compassion, all the rest of it. I mean, I look at my environment as an opportunity, not as a threat. Yeah, so if I had someone come to me who hasn't experienced all the trauma that I've been through, of course I'm going to welcome them with open arms. 
and I I understand that their experience is, is valid. I'm not going to disregard that. Uh, anybody that does that is they're not somebody you should be associating with. They're not your friend. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for that. that, that see, getting a bit of advice personally <laughs> is yeah, always yeah, yeah. helpful. No. I, I I try to take on. I try to understand, and I look up to people, man. Um, that is the that is the mindset and that is the mindset of you know when you go through something mm. welcome life with open arms um yeah. move on um be all you can be in a way i don't know we we have so many empty words empty phrases for it um and it's <laughs> it's it's kind of like telling people that it's going to be brilliant <laughs> it's not going to be brilliant it's going to be okay like it is now but slightly more open and a bit more happy <laughs> yeah well but, yeah I mean, I mean people tell you you know life's gonna get better well that's bullshit i mean you make it better you work at yeah. it <laughs> you know, that's the only way you can hmm. yeah. man we've gone like it's been two hours and eight minutes yeah we should pull, this to a, should pull this to a close but we should do it again sometime Man, yeah, man, this is this is fun. Thank you very much.